I won't bother with any more introductions. Mark Dice has correctly identified that these people might be protesting, but they're kind of right, but for the wrong reasons. Now, you get no prizes in life for being right for the wrong reasons, and he's going to illustrate. I like how Mark Dice really is. Now, a lot of people think that he might be controlled opposition, same as everybody else. But he has correctly identified, and he can prove, and here's cast iron proof, that these people don't know why they're protesting. Um, so it's a funny thing. Uh, like What these people are doing are LARPing, and if they don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, then they are useful idiots. And there's agent provocateurs within the organisation within their organisation, within their protest group, who are egging them on and getting them to do things that they don't understand why they're doing things. But it'll come out that many, if not most of them arrested, weren't even students and are just outside agitators and organisers because there is something bigger going on here than just groups of students at college campuses now across the country all of a sudden being upset about what it is that's happening over there in Gaza. And this is not as simple as... The protesters are bad, according to Fox News, and are all Hamas sympathizers. And Israel is good and can never do anything wrong, ever, and never has. Or if you watch MSNBC, they'll say that all of the protesters are just, you know, bleeding heart liberals that care about the humanitarian crisis over in Gaza. And none of them support Hamas or violence at all. Which is, that's not true. Unlike over at the Daily Wire and Fox News and most mainstream conservative media outlets and talk shows, I believe that you're allowed to question and or criticize Israel and their treatment of Palestinian civilians. And you're allowed to be sad about Palestinian loss of life and the humanitarian crisis over there in Gaza. All right, here's cast iron proof that these people don't know what they're doing and um, they don't understand what it is they're really protesting about. Now, these people are not our friends. They are useful idiots, communist pawns, who don't even really know what it is that they are protesting. What do you say is the main goal with tonight's uh, protest? I think the goal is just showing our support for Palestine and demanding that NYU stops. I honestly don't know okay. all of what NYU's doing. Is there something that NYU's doing? I really don't oh. know. I'm pretty sure they're... Do you know what NYU's doing? <laughs> about what? About Israel. Why what? are we protesting here? Uh, yeah. Palestine will be free! I wish I was more educated. I'm not either. Oh. <laughs> but they're there showing their support for the cause. And have you noticed how many of these morons are wearing masks? And it's not to hide their face so that they can't get recognized. They're still worried about being in crowds because of the... But this woman takes the cake. She was demanding that Columbia University bring food in to the building that the students and the outside paid provocateurs took over, calling that a humanitarian crisis. Why should the university be obligated to provide food to people who've taken over a building? Uh, well, for, first of all, we're saying that they're obligated to provide food to students who pay for a meal plan here. But you mentioned that there was a request to, that food and water be brought in, unless I misunderstood. To allow it to be brought in. I mean, well, I guess it's ultimately a question of what kind of community and obligation Columbia feels it has to its students. Um, do you want students to die of dehydration and starvation or get severely ill, even if they disagree with you? If the answer is no, then you should allow basic, I mean, it's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid we're asking for. Like, could people please have a glass of water? I guess it's nice to include the one there as well who kind of got herself trapped, or maybe it's a bit of stage fright, and uh, she started calling it's a human humanitarian crisis on their own campus that people didn't have food and water. But the primary point there anyway is that uh, these people don't know what they're protesting about, even though they actually might be right, but they don't know why they're right. My, I will say my opinion, right? This, it is pretty clear. I don't know any Palestinians, but it is pretty clear to me that they are the ones who are being basically preyed upon, uh, destroyed, uh, attacked by a far larger and more powerful enemy and um you know the, 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 i can't say that i'm an expert on, on anything there but from what i've read up on my eyes have been opened anyway you know on history and politics and you know world geography and history and how, how it all kind of comes together and where we are now but of course these people haven't looked into it but they want to be part of whatever is a popular protest because they like popularity and they like to feel that they are heroic 
And also, these are the kind of people who don't like what they call white people. So there's a, there's a curious contradiction going on, and all those people who don't understand what they're doing will meet this contradiction. They'll co- they, and they'll meet it in a way that will be harmful to them because they won't understand what's going on. Anyway, uh, I want to get on to, I suppose, some analogies here. Um, what we're dealing with here, I suppose, is... And I would like to have had time to set this all out a bit more slowly and gently, but we're dealing here with a sort of a game of life. These people are doing... What they're engaging in is is life as though it were a game, and they're still children. And as a child, life can be like a game. It can seem like that, you know, it doesn't matter what we do because our parents are there to protect us. And even if we do get injured, they're there to repair the harm for us. And no, no harm really, no permanent harm can come to us. So in that sense, it's, game, it's a game of life. But when we start growing up, that's when we go through the, the transition of, of, of adolescence from childhood into adulthood. That's the way it used to, That's what the only transition used to be. And uh, it can be a struggle. It can be a painful struggle. And you have to go through a certain amount of pain. And, and it doesn't end just when you, you know, stop being a teenager and we start being 20. It continues onwards, uh, this growth. And it never really ends. And that's why life is the great teacher. And as an adult, then, life is no longer a game. It's, it's serious. It's a game of life and death. But what I want to say to you is, is that oftentimes I just see something and I pick up a word and a word gives me an idea and I ruminate on it. Or maybe sometimes an idea just comes to me straight away that's been in my subconscious or in the back of my mind for quite some time. And I looked at, I looked at a label which said a set of three boxes. And the Spanish translation was Juego de three cajas. I'm deliberately pronouncing it in a way that a Spanish person wouldn't. Juego de tres, I suppose it is, maybe something like that, cajas. But it's more like maybe juego, juego de tres cajas, something like that. Three boxes. So a juego is a set, but a, we- a juego or juego is also a game. And I know that in French, jeu or jeu is a game. So in French and in Spanish, both the, the same word can be translated as a game or as a set. And they don't make any distinction between that. And indeed, you know, when I was younger, I, used to, I remember seeing that a lot of games of things were called a set of things, like that there was a set of dice and that a game of Monopoly would be called a Monopoly set, or a game of Cluedo would be called a Cluedo set. So, again, that word, I think, has come through to us from something. And maybe it's a bit of a, re- a reach, maybe it's a bit of a stretch. Um, but my thinking is, is that Set and Seth, the sort of childhood friend of Horus, that he was, his name could be spelled S-E-T or S-E-T-H, and his role or function uh, when he was a child was as a game, as was as maybe a, either a stepfather or as a as somebody to have sort of childhood friendly matches with friendly games, friendly games of of maybe challenge or or friendly battles, but when. Horus started growing up, then the games weren't just playful anymore, that they were serious. And the, this became a serious battle. And looking into the mythology, which is a story, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It's part of a, a civilization, a founding culture of a civilization. It's part, part of the, the, the foundational stories or narratives. It doesn't mean that they're not true if we call them a myth or a mythos. It means that it's the foundation stone or the, the stories and the history on, upon which a civilization is founded and how they, how they understand themselves. Or maybe it's the keystone which ties everything together that's built on top of that then. And it's the keystone without which everything falls apart. So that's why we can't throw away our old stories. And I, and I know that people might be familiar with uh, movies that came out maybe in the, in not too long after 2001, sometimes in the, sometime in the early 20th 
21st century rather I should say called Zeitgeist which means in German the spirit of the times and it pretty much demonstrated among other things how all religions are pretty much describing the same thing. Now, I know a lot of people didn't like that because they thought, well, my religion is the true religion, for example, Christianity. You know, that Jesus, the son of God uh, or the son of Mary and Joseph on earth, um, that he was God made flesh and he was God made made man on earth, that they figured, well, that's that's our real religion, our true religion, that's sacrosanct, whereas... The Egyptian religion is not comparable. It's not the same. Whatever parallels are there, we don't want to hear about it. That's um, sort of heresy or that's sacrilegious. Um, maybe a lot of people didn't like it for that reason. Other people would have looked at it and said, OK, so if we have Isis being the equivalent of Mary and Horus being the equivalent of Jesus and Osiris being the equivalent of either God in heaven or Joseph on earth and Ra maybe was God in heaven, well... What that means is a lot of maybe atheistic or secular looking people would have said, well, that's just different primitive people throughout different times uh, having just different versions of the same religion over and over again repackaged. And I think they would have considered, OK, that proves then that there's nothing to these stories. They're just stories without any foundation in actuality. They're just stories for children. Right. So I, I've come around to thinking that these aren't myths in, in what we have come to think of what a myth means. A myth doesn't mean that something is a fable. And a fable doesn't mean something is untrue or just made up. Um, so as Darren Swift there says, except life is not a game. No, it isn't. Or like mythos and like game, we have come to misunderstand what those words mean because the meanings of those words as we see all the other words and even in our own lifetime have been twisted gradually to mean something different that's how they change our understanding and our perceptions so a game isn't just for nothing a game is practice a game is getting us used to what we need to do when we are adults and every game has an adversary and set is the adversary here the set can be spelled s-e-t or s-e-t-h now, I want to see if I can show you video here of, there's a sort of a term called re recapitulation, which can mean bowing down to something again, but it, it seems to also mean a replaying of the same story over and over again. And that's because, I guess, people ha don't change throughout the, time, throughout, throughout the ages. Their characteristics stay the same and their tendencies stay the same and what they do stays the same. But it's just got a different tapestry or a different background or a different cultural flavor to it. And so, for example, you know, uh, Mary and Joseph is a recapitulation of Adam and Eve. And there are other versions of that, too. So I suppose we could say, you know, that the Egyptian flavor of it of Osiris and Isis, and then Horus, their son, is a retelling of of Jesus and Mary and Joseph, even though that's not saying that it's just a story. It's just things happen over and over again because human beings are human beings, and people are people, and there's archetypes, all right? But I don't want to go near Jordan Peterson. So life is a game, yes, when you're a child, but it's serious when you're an adult, and and as above, so below, when you play a game, what you're, what you're actually reenacting is what life is. And every game has an opponent or an adversary. And those terms mean really something who sits opposite you or faces you and may oppose you in a way that they stand for something that is ideologically in opposition to you. Or it could mean that, you know, th there is a board, there is the earth, there is a plane of existence, which the board, the playing, the playing field represents. And they want to conquer that territory. And they stand opposite you to conquer that territory. So I, I want to show you a, a, an Egyptian representation of that, that you can see in the picture here. That's what's called the game of, of Senet, S-E-N-E-T. And it's pretty clear to me that that is what gave its name to the Senate as in the upper house of our governments, um, where they, you know, talk shop and talk about this and that and are supposed to be the, 
one of the last stops uh, of the uh, of the law that might be getting passed through the lower house, the, the the assembly or the congress or the parliament or that kind of thing. And Senate is known as the game of passing. Um, so I'm going to see if I can just play you a clip from uh, the TV series Lost, which represents a lot of these motifs. And it's showing another recapitulation, I think, of uh, the Egyptian flavour, but in a sort of um, a more maybe Mesopotamian flavour. Um, but, I mean, it's coming out of Egypt as well in the Exodus. So what we have is Jacob and Esau, who kind of represent us too, two different, something that has continued with us and come with us through the ages. And they are showing how it's been repackaged again, Horus's battle with Seth. And they're showing how they are playing it as a game, and even though these look like adult actors, they are children just growing up as well. She know you visit me. She never asked about you. And I'm sorry I asked about her. Why do you watch us, Jacob? Mm -hmm. I watch because... I want to know if Mother's right. Right about what? About them. Oh, you mean my people. You want to know if they're bad. That woman may be insane, but she's most definitely right about that. I don't know. Doesn't seem so bad to me. Well, it's easy for you to say. Looking down on us from above. Trust me. I've lived among them for 30 years. They're greedy. Manipulative. Untrustworthy and selfish. And why are you with them? They're a means to an end. Okay, well, look, that should hopefully speak volumes there. I mean, th this is maybe why I'm saying that I really ought to go through Lost and just show how it explains everything. Um, but there they are. These people who are mortals have, but have become gods in a way, Jacob and Esau, they're our founding fathers. And... They're fathers of tribes. And this is, it's come out of a desert. And here we are now. We are descendants of Jacob and Esau. And the battle or the game of life continues on. And life is a grand checkerboard or a game of senate or a game of passing. And our memory gets wiped each time the board gets redrawn or the pieces get put away and put back in the board, our memories don't retain, they don't stay with us. But maybe for some people they do. Now, um, there's the game of Senate there. And um, just in case you didn't hear that earlier, the game of life is El Juego de la Vida, or El Juego de la Vida, the game of life. And Juego is a set, or it's a game. Now, what I was sort of describing to there was the contendings of Horus and Seth. Another recapitulation of this, or another retelling of that, of this, is think of Jaffa in the, in the Aladdin, or the Thousand and One Nights. So the Arabian version of it tells the same thing again. Um, it's What we have is it's a story about how there's sort of an illegitimate king. Like, so Seth was the uncle of of Horus and he killed Osiris so that's how he got to be the king it's very you could compare it to the the play of Macbeth where there's a, again an illegitimate killing of the king a king killing ritual being done and then there's a usurper to the throne but then the young boy must grow up and reclaim his birthright so we see that story being told over and over again. And, I, and I'm going to say, I think Aladdin must be the story of that. Like, he's the secret prince and he must defeat the evil Jafar. But also, I think that's pretty much the story in Simba, where there's, isn't there an evil lion and he has taken the, the throne. But really, you know, the, and the lion is the symbol of royalty. But he, mu he must get the throne back and then, and then bring peace and order to the kingdom, restore the kingdom to its rightful status because some evil jackals and other prey animals have come in to take control of the kingdom. 
So it's the same kind of story over and over again. And we are reliving that story, except life isn't a game, but because we take it very seriously, and it is seriously, it is serious. We don't know if there's an afterlife for sure. But if we could view it from upon high, like either Asa or Jacob was there, uh, then, th- you know, they, they say comedy is tragedy plus time or distance or both. So we would see it as a game or maybe the gods looking down from Mount Olympus would see the lives of the mortals as just a game that are very transcendiary, uh, that they're transcendent, that they're just very temporary because the gods just see men be born, grow up and die, you know, like maybe from a different time perspective. But to the, to the mortals down there, they, they see life uh, as great pain and suffering and arduous and something that they have to struggle through, whereas the gods maybe can't understand that or, for, or, or have forgotten that from their perspective up high on Mount Olympus. The other story then is the Thief of Baghdad. I was just looking it up. Upon which the, the story of Aladdin and the Thousand and One Nights and him becoming then maybe the... That the prince, even though the evil Jafar maybe was his uncle, but he either knew or didn't know. I mean, there's so many tellings and retellings of these stories, so many different versions of these stories of the Egyptian mythology. And it's very weird stuff and things to our ears we think is is very strange. And um, maybe also why we don't want to equate it to Christ, the Christian type of, of story, because um, we think that it's... Uh, very sexualized, you know, yeah, maybe we'll say that in, in a very carnal way. Uh, but the Thief of Baghdad is supposed to be maybe what is either Aladdin is based on or Aladdin is based on it, but either which way. Um, same kind of an idea. It's It's a motif. It's a standard story with a structure. And it might change a little bit throughout the ages, but that accommodates whatever culture happens to be alive that accepts whatever it accepts at the time. I think things come through to us, like, say, a tennis match. And and why do we say, you know, game, set and match? And there's one of the most famous games of tennis you know, between McEnroe Jimmy and Jimmy yeah, Connors. And, you know, why why is there all these, th- these words, right? The, the people never really ask, why do we call this, you know, wh- why, is, why is it called... Um, you know, why do we say game, set and match? And I think what it is is that, like to say things in triplicate, game, set and match. Well, a set is a game and a match is also a game of of, of sport. It's, it's a challenge between two players. So match and a game and match point, game point, it's the same thing. But a set is also a set of games. It's, it's, we're saying the same thing. So why are they repeating themselves? Well, there's a rule of three. And there's the trinity, of course, in, in Christianity. Um, but I've noticed, of course, that it's not just in Christianity. There's the trinity of Isis, Osiris, and Horus uh, in the Egyptian mythology. And you'll find it in other mythologies as well. You know, the trinity is something that's not exclusive to Christianity. And there's a rule of threes in comedy and, and in literature you, to sort of make your point be nailed down properly, to define... A plane, you need three points. Uh, a line is two points. A plane in 3D is three points. You go from just literature in two points, maybe, or just um, a line of thought in two points to making it more actual by having three points. And you sort of nail something down and get people to accept something or get people to understand it three different ways and therefore maybe find the humour funny or they find the concept engaging or lights a fire in their mind if you put something in threes. And so you can create something with the rule of threes and you can bring something to a complete end, a total terminus with the rule of threes as well. Now, when I was thinking about this set of three, right, it, it was just a set of three boxes there, and the Spanish translation was Juego de Three Cajas, or Juego de Three Cajas. And in French, it's Je, or Je. And, and uh, just to remind you, anyway, in case it didn't come out earlier, they don't make a distinction between a set and a game. And when I was a kid... A, a game of Monopoly was called a Monopoly set. Will you take out the Monopoly set there? Or a game of Cluedo, or Clue, if you want to call it that. A Cluedo set, we would say. And so there was a lot of games, like like a tennis ball set. There was a lot of things that were 
called sets. And we meant a game. Or maybe we didn't realise that's what we meant, but we did mean that. So, a set of three, way go. The three. Uh, in French, it's J-E-U-X. In Spanish, it's J-E-U-G-O. And Jumanji is a world of games. That, that movie, Jumanji. So, je, a game to play with somebody. You need an opponent. And you need set. Seth, Horace's opponent. So Seth was Horace's uncle and childhood friend. Horace didn't know at the time that, that Seth had killed his father, Osiris. But maybe once he became to understand this, then Seth was no longer his friend. He became his enemy, his adversary. So he brought him up. Maybe he told him stories. But then when Horace grew up or started becoming a teenager and a pretender or a contender for the throne. He contended for the throne. So, although Seth played games with him, children learn through fun and games and childhood friendships. But sometimes childhood friends, you don't bring them with you through into adulthood, and sometimes they become your enemies. So one day when we grow up, the game of life becomes serious. The Juego de la Vida. And Seth becomes not merely an opponent with whom to play games, but a serious adversary. And Seth blinds Horus in one eye. So maybe that's representative for he can't see what's going on, at least out of one side of his eye. One side of his mind can't understand because he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't see what's going on. What Seth did to him. And Horus must raise himself up high into the sky then to get a bird's eye view. So he must ascend and he must make himself better. And I think it's said that the, the Egyptian goddess of love and she maybe cured the blindness in Hosiris's eye. Maybe that was his moon eye. One of his eyes was the sun, one was the moon. So the moon eye he was blinded in. Maybe that was his left eye or his right eye, I can't remember. Um, but maybe, again, there's a parallel to Christianity there when Jesus says, you know, the only way is to love people. But, but love means, I think, to love the truth and to follow the path of truth. No matter how painful it is, no matter how terrible the, the, the truths are, no matter how much anguish it causes to learn the truth, that you still follow the truth, no matter what the cost, and no matter how many people ostracize you or call you names, you must still follow the truth. And that's the, that's the learning process, and that's the ascending process. That's the making oneself better process. So... A uh, game set and match then is, as I say, you know, heard to conclude fully, finally, the end of a tennis match. But really, you know, these words are the, the variations of the same thing. It's game set and match. Battle, 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 struggle, struggle, struggle. And things are, as I say, brought to a terminal conclusion by, by this thrice repetition. It's like spells casting. And uh, as I said already, things are also created by the power of three. And compared to the the explosion of the first, as they tell us anyway, the first nuclear bomb by Oppenheimer and friends uh, at the Trinity site, uh, where they themselves say that primal matter was torn apart and fused back together into what they call a new element, a new radioactive green coloured element known as what they call Trinitite. Now, I have personally witnessed, a few years ago, when I was working in a global corporation, I, I witnessed a department being created around me. There was already the concept of the department, but we didn't really have our own funding. So we were sort of attached to another department. So we were sort of like, in a way, you could say we were, we were being gestated by that other department. But then one day we were ready to become an official department in its own right, a global department of this multinational corporation and I witnessed the day that it was created from being a concept, from being an idea, from being something that was known but didn't really have any status in the world or in the corporation to actually then being taken seriously and that was the day that it was tied to its permanent source of nutrition and that was the finance department. It had its own funding from the finance department. And what made that real was the signatures of three directors, one from the American uh, department or division of the corporation, one from the European, 
the EMEA and one from the Asian Economic Subdivision. So those three directors together in triplicate as a trinity signed the existence of this department into reality. Uh, and when I saw them doing that, I mean, I knew that, that very few people in the corporation would go, ah, oh, OK, we have a rule of three here. We have a holy trinity coming together to create a new life, as it were, because they really see corporations and departments as life, as corpuses. And if you didn't know this, like corporations have the same rights in the USA and by proxy then everywhere else in the world that uses the conventions of corporatism. Every corporation has the same rights as a living human being. So they are, if you want to think of it this way, they're, they're, they're like zombies that, that walk across the earth and have far more power than any individual and they have legal rights in the same way as a human being does. So it's not a stretch to say that an entity was created on that day, a large, powerful entity. Um, and I suspect that those directors understood that as well. And I think, you know, Masonic type people would, as they would have had to have been. So there we see Osiris, who is dead. That's why I think he's blue. And he's coming back and saying, avenge me, son. And Isis is saying, yes, my son will take the, the throne again and there there are the contentions there of of Seth and Horus and Horus being the sun god and he's got a staff with an ankh upter upturned on him there look that's pretty much it I certainly didn't do it perfectly maybe someday I mean it's been something that's been brewing for a while it's one of those things I've been meaning to talk about for a while but it's things are coming to a head now that we see events in Palestine uh, nothing has changed since the days of Babylon. Nothing has changed since the rivers of Babylon. That's the text there showing or reading, sorry, writing about the, the contentions, in other words, the battles of Seth and Horus. Started out as a game but turned into reality. And Isis giving birth again and again. These stories, as you see there, are told again and again. The same motifs, the same archetypes. The prince must avenge the killing of his father and his evil uncle, who has taken the throne but is not the rightful he's not the rightful heir to the throne so in the same way parallels can be drawn and must be drawn and i won't spell it out for you on this platform between who now currently hold the throne of the world but they're not they're pretending to be the rightful heir but they're not so we have crime happiness ambition laid out on that checkerboard there so what the Egyptians were trying to tell us, what the Babylonians were trying to tell us, what the Greeks were trying to tell us, and what earlier Disney movies were telling us, is the same stories. And they're not just stories. There's something about reality that we need to understand. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening. That's about the game of life, and it's, it's unfolding before our eyes.